Good morrow to you all. You have fallen on bad times. Brought to you by the Royal Holloway Shakespeare Society. You join me, Theo Dudridge. And me, Subhan Hay, as we bear some bloody truth. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Bar Times. This is the Bar Times Halloween Spooktacular and it is going to be one hell of a night. We have four guests lined up for you tonight uh, and we also have a little audio drama extracty bit for you guys uh, from the Marlowe play Dr. Faustus. So opening up tonight's episode we have Grace Munro who is a first year history student. Say hi Grace. Hello. How are you doing? How are you doing? Um, I'm, I'm doing fine, thanks. Yeah. Great, great stuff. Studies. Nice, nice. Um, so as I said, you're a first year history student. Uh, how are you finding first year so far? Um, fun, very fun. Um, very surprising and different to what I've experienced before. So it's, yeah, it's just the whole the whole experience of it really it's quite new and slowly getting used to it fair how did you find the whole general move from i'm i'm gonna assume sick form to uni or uh college to uni like how what was the kind of vibe um i, I, went, I went to college so fair. yeah i mean we had a certain amount of independence at, at college but yeah i think even the transition from college to uni it's still very you know significant and um you know I'm kind of this is the first time in my life where I'm kind of just doing everything by myself so it's yeah it's a lot to take in fair fair I mean yeah the uni like the transitioning to, to any kind of university is is like interesting um how are you finding settling into societies and stuff are there any other sort of societies and clubs that you've sort of gotten yourself involved with at the uni or things that you want to try kind of later on in term like how are you finding the kind of social life aspect of it um i mean obviously i've joined the shakespeare society nice very good (laughs) (laughs) uh i've also joined the history society ah nice yeah so um they're the two that that i've joined so far the since you're also allowed to join societies in second year, I've got an idea of which ones I might want to join next year. Fair. So, um, you know, I mean, I don't want to do it all, all in one, you know, all in one go. You know, five societies and yeah. don't have a bit that around studies, so I'm probably going to join those next year. <laughs> uh, I mean, like something I've sort of learned from like my two years going on three years at uni now is like you can pace yourself. Um, I ended up joining some really interesting societies in my second year um and it's great just to kind of have the freedom to kind of pick and choose there is no social pressure to join a society at the beginning of a year you can just go into it and it is it is a nice it is a nice feeling so um it's great that you've kind of got that set up already um so obviously this is the halloween special uh so i'm gonna ask a very important question of what are your plans for halloween gosh (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I mean, there's that there's that um, event going on Sunday, isn't there, with the Shakespeare Society? Is there it, is. is the yeah, so um, shameless plug, but uh, we are doing a pack horse uh, drinking event. By the time this episode goes up, people will probably already be there, but there is an event at the pack horse. Um, so we're just going to be having a chill kind of pub social there to kind of see the Halloween night in. Um, so, yeah. Uh, do you have a costume planned for Halloween, or are you just gonna just gonna vibe? Um, I've got two ideas. To be fair, fair so <laughs> I'm kind of uh, I'm torn between the two at the minute, but uh, I guess I'll just figure it out on the night. Um, if it if it helps, I've just got a Shakespeare mask, and that is my costume. <laughs> so t- <laughs> literally just the mask. Just the mask, nothing else. Oh, I'll find some clothes, dark clothes, and just a Shakespeare mask. That is that is the entire outfit. That is I mean, that if you is... want to save money, if you want to save money, then yeah, yeah the math is pretty. <laughs> That's true. That's all you need. That's all you need. Um, yeah. So uh, this week, as you're aware, uh, our general topic is Elizabethan ghost stories and urban myths, uh, kind of superstitions and stuff like that. Uh, as a history student, how much do you already know about this topic? 
I mean, contextually, I think it all just links down to context, really. Um, I, I know that um, they believe in, they believed a lot in witches around yeah. that time, but I don't think their perception of of Halloween as we know it today um, is was sorry the same. Um, no, I think it all kind of back then related to how they lived their lives every day. So it wasn't just yeah. one day every year; it was just in general their their lives in general. It all kind of centered around that. Yeah, no, that's that's very insightful. That's very insightful. So um, I have got um, three facts that I'm going to kind of read out, and uh, we're just we're just going to discuss them. Uh, some of these you might already know. Um, but a lot of these, when I was going through them, really, really surprised me. So the first one that I've got, it was unlucky, or it was very unlucky, to keep the feather of a peacock. The pattern on the feather was seen as an evil eye. What do you think about this? Um, (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I can see why they might have been a bit, you know, superstitious of peacocks in the sense they're very yeah. unusual and a bit strange, you know, when you think about it, how they kind of work, you know, with the colourful feathers colourful feathers and stuff. But it's just really random, you know. Yeah. It's, just the, pattern <laughs> they, it's the pattern that they naturally have as a peacock and that they're, they're yeah. evil. evil. <laughs> yeah. It's, well, yeah. it's like the whole thing with black cats uh, being kind of... Uh, known as sort of witches familiars um i guess as well like nature and certain like animals within nature i mean it'll be this would have been an interesting fact to bring up with um uh our last guest jack who's a zoology student it's interesting how like you know patterns in nature they sort of feared and you know you look at peacock feathers and they are like really beautiful they're really um kind of inspiring to look at because you sort of wonder like how the patterns kind of came about i mean i'm talking out of my ass with this i genuinely don't know but um no that is that is really interesting so second fact uh i am going to read out to you um walking under a ladder uh, was considered bad luck because ladders were associated with gallows, which were the frames or structure of which people were executed through hanging. What do you think about this? I actually read that. I saw that uh, somewhere on the site. It, yeah, that's it's so strange. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, to be fair, I can kind of see why if, it, if it's associated if it was associated with execution. Yeah, I can see why. You, you, you would be very cautious, wouldn't you? But if it bears no relevance to an execution at the time, you wouldn't just, like, like if you just saw a random ladder or something in the street, you wouldn't just be like, oh, I don't want to get executed. <laughs> Let's not cross that ladder. <laughs> yeah. No, it is. It is. Um, I think as well, like, because in modern day as well, there's a whole thing of, like, walking under a ladder brings bad luck. Um mm. I mean, more just because if you walk under a ladder, there's the potential of you'll knock the person who's on it off the ladder, uh, which would not be good, which wouldn't be good. Uh, And the final fact I have. um, So they believed that the seventh son of the seventh son was possessed to have supernatural powers. Mm. What do you think of this? Because I I saw this, I was just like, that is so random yeah yeah i mean the thing is where do they get these these ideas from you know the seventh what was it the seventh son of this the seventh son of the seventh son yeah that it's really it's really strange like what why the number seven like where do they get it from (laughs) it's really i don't understand (laughs) um i mean I think if anything, that just highlights just how superstitious they were because yeah, because of the randomness. I don't know what else to say. I mean, so the number seven is one of the most significant in the Bible. Scholars say it denotes completeness or perfection. So, in I, oh. I guess relating to that, it's more like yeah. the seventh son, the seventh son. That's like the ultimate form of like perfection. 
Uh, so they're kind of at their peak. I don't know what superpowers they would possess. But, uh, yeah. I feel like that's a very good premise for like a, an Elizabethan like Marvel <laughs> superhero. Marvel TM. Marvel TM superhero. Uh, yeah. So uh, that is all we've got time for, for um, this uh, minisode with you today, Grace. Thank you very much for coming along. And uh, we're now going to move on to our next guest of the evening. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Bar Times. Uh, this is the second guest of the evening. Uh, so we are joined by the lovely president of Shakespeare Society herself, Madoka Pond. Say hi. Hi. How are you doing? I'm okay. I've got a bit of a cold. So if you hear that in my voice, if you hear that <laughs> in my acting, <laughs> all I can say nice. is sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um basically after we've done uh our interview with meadow we're gonna be playing you guys a short extract from dr faustus <laughs> exclusively for halloween and meadow is playing a couple of fact, all of the guests tonight yeah are playing various different characters um <laughs> yeah uh so those of you who don't know meadow capon is the current president of shakespeare society she was the first year rep of shakespeare in her first year. Uh, she played Virgilia in Corrie and Leonis, and she also cameoed briefly in Savoy Opera Society's Anything Goes as Ensemble. Um, so yeah, let's, let's, um, let's get down to the basics here. What's it like being a society president so far? It's really exciting. Like, um, It's really nice being back in person. It feels so different, but it's so welcomed. Like, the amount of new people we have in society and new people we've met is so exciting. Um, and yeah, it's just it's just nice to think of all the possibilities of all the events and stuff we can do now that we're back in person. It's really exciting. <laughs> incredible, incredible stuff. Um, is there anything that you can exclusively reveal that's uh, coming up in the works with Shakespeare Society? <laughs> Well, we do have, oh, can I talk about our election? We can talk about our election. All right. We've got <laughs> two committee positions opening up really soon next month. We've got a position of first year rep opening, which Theo mentioned I was in my first year. Lots of fun. Very it's a good role. It's a good role. It's a good one. Isn't it? <laughs> um, and we also have the position of secretary opening as uh, Theo will be our vice president um yes if you're interested keep an eye out on our facebook and instagram because we will be electing two new uh committee members next month very exciting good stuff good stuff and uh yeah on that note if you uh want to drop a message to the page if you have any more uh info about uh, either of the roles because first year rep and meadow correct me if i'm wrong mm -hmm. uh it's first year of study so that doesn't matter if you're a first year like a BA first year or if you're a first year PhD student or if you're a first year master's student so the roles open up to any you just have to be new to the university basically mm -hmm. uh, so if you're interested in applying for any of those roles I mean secretary secretary is a role that I've done for a long time now uh, <laughs> my hands I can feel the calluses on my hands so as I'm just typing. writing, just typing, just <laughs> so, so much typing. Um, I have bionic hands now. This is the <laughs> revolution that we've kind of come to. But um, if you're interested in either of those roles, drop the page a message and uh, we can get back to you. Uh, so moving swiftly on to um, kind of the main, the main part of this show with, with before a little cheeky plug. Um, have you got any plans for Halloween? Well, <laughs> I will be working on Halloween during Yeah. <laughs> do, but I work at Matilda, so it's a good time. I'm sure I'll, I'll bump into lots of dressed up children. Yeah. Oh, um, that'd be nice. I do have exciting costume plans because Go I on. a couple costume with my boyfriend, who's nice. also a Royal Holloway alumnus. Very exciting. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're going as uh, the Phantom of the Opera and Christine from. Ooh the phantom of the opera very good <laughs> so, very good yeah, i will be sure to be posting that on my instagram so. <laughs> nice nice another another cheeky plug if you want to follow our present <laughs> on instagram, instagram Meadow, Meadow. Okay, nice <laughs> so 
this week, uh, as you're aware, our general topic is Elizabethan ghost stories and urban myths. Um, so how much do you already know about this? Are there any cool facts that you want to share with us uh, now? I actually don't know much about uh, the myths. Um, obviously, I love me a bit of Shakespeare. I love, you know, I love a good witch. And I love <laughs> Beth, you know, I love the yeah. girl, but from the time in general, I don't actually know many myths. So I'm, I'm very excited to find out. Well, it's more just sort of myths uh, and beliefs and just things that were kind of around in the time that um, people in the Elizabethan age uh, were just kind of clueless on and put, put it down to a lot of kind of supernatural beliefs. So uh, I have prepared uh, a few facts that I would like to talk about with you today. Uh, these all come from one PowerPoint, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but they're all like, you know, they're interesting kind of topic points. There were some that I didn't know. There were some that I, there were some that I feel like I gathered from horrible histories, but honestly, yeah. like, you know, it's, uh, it is what it is. It is what it is. Um, so the first kind of uh, thing that I'd like to discuss uh, is the idea that one example of a belief that was carried from the Elizabethan era um, is that sneezing with your mouth open allows the devil to enter within, provoking harmful behaviour. So saying, yeah, so this is why today we say bless you, uh, because apparently that counters the devil out, as as it said that no devil can stay in a blessed place. Um so how do you how do you feel about that it's so funny I did know that yeah but um it's I think it's so funny how we keep it to this day like it's yeah just we say without even thinking about the connotations um yeah that's super interesting yeah I mean I think as well like it's more done I think for us as kind of a politeness thing like yeah, if someone definitely. sneezes it's either someone else who says it if the other person just can't recover themselves in time or if it's like so it's kind of like we're all looking out for each other so kind even if of, I guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, yeah. my dad used to used to be like <laughs> you should not be blessed for sneezing you should <laughs> damn <laughs> so maybe next time someone sneezes he can say damn you instead of bless you and see oh, how no. The devil's just the the devil's now more buff than ever, just kind it's of entering. So true, so true. you just encourage the devil. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next fact I have for you is uh, spilling salt or pepper was considered to bring upon bad luck, most likely because spices were expensive during the Elizabethan era. Right. Interesting. So is yeah. it like I think I there's something about salt and <laughs> and supernatural. I maybe. knew I knew about salt because obviously you have like salt circles are meant to yeah, prevent exactly. like spirits crossing. Um, but I guess like well, I guess as well that's why if you break a salt line or a salt circle, that allows spirits to yeah to kind of enter through. Um, so yeah, that that's an interesting. An interesting one. Yeah, so you can't be clumsy. <laughs> the yeah. amount of salt I, I spill. I'm so so unlucky. Yeah. Um, so the next fact that I have, um, and again, this is one you probably will have been aware of in some capacity. Uh, it was unlucky for a black cat to cross your path. The colour of black is associated with evil magic, and a cat was strongly associated with a witch. Uh-huh, yes. Yeah. I have a black cat myself. Oh, um, called Skittles though. <laughs> um, and I call him my familiar. So I'm definitely I vibe with this one. You know what? I I'm a big fan of a black cat. Um, <laughs> I think that's discrimination against black cats. I don't think it's bad luck, but um, <laughs> I I think the vibe of witches and cats. I just think that's super cool. I love the witch. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, no, it is. It is incredibly interesting. I mean, I sadly don't own any cats, but um, there's always, Sorry. yeah, I always see because um, I live in Englefield Green currently, okay. so I always see um, various different cats along the path. And I have seen. I mean, last night as I was walking back home, I did see a black cat. 
uh, just outside my house and it just kind of darted into the garden. Bad happened to you since seeing the black cat? Um, well, touch wood, nothing <laughs> so far. Oh, God. Uh, at the time of recording this, everything is hunky dory. And then you show up on the news. Tomorrow. Oh, no. Oh, no. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> would not be looking forward to that um and finally the final elizabethan fact we're going to discuss in your minisode um the saying knock on wood to prevent bad luck or an evil eye originated during the elizabethan era oh did it do you know the origin do you know why yeah i do i i do actually um it was said uh to kind of originated um during the 19th century, uh, one common explanation traces to the phenomenon of uh, ancient pagan cultures, such as the Celts, who believed that spirits and gods resided in trees. Knocking on tree trunks uh, may have served to rouse the spirits and call on their protection. So knocking on wood is a sign of, like, you know, good luck. Because, you know, when when you mentioned about the whole, like, bad luck thing, my instinct was to just you know knock yeah. on my desk because it's the whole like touch wood or knock on wood thing yeah um because uh yeah it's a sign of good luck and it calls forth good spirits anyway so that is all we have time for for your minnesota today meadow thank you so much for coming along uh next up uh we will take a short break uh to play the short clip from dr faustus and then we will go into our final two guests of the evening adonia who has done some amazing artwork for this audio drama it's what you're going to be seeing tonight and jack hardman who played faustus himself um so yeah look forward to that and uh we'll see you guys soon Welcome, gentlemen. Now, worthy Faustus, methinks your looks are changed. Oh, gentlemen. What ails Faustus? Oh, my sweet chamber bedfellow, had I lived with thee, then I had lived still, but now I must die eternally. Look, sirs, comes he not, comes he not. Oh, my dear Faustus, what imports this fear? Is all our pleasure turned to melancholy? He is not well, being over solitary. If it be so, we'll, we'll have physicians, and Faustus shall be cured. Tis but a surfeit, sir. Fear nothing. A surfeit of deadly sin, which had damned both body and soul. Yet, Faustus, look up to heaven and remember, God's mercy is infinite. O oh, gentlemen, hear me with patience, and tremble not at my speeches, though my heart pants and quivers to remember that I had been a student here for thirty years. Oh, would I had never seen Wittenberg, never read book, and what wonders I have done all Germany can witness. Oh, sweet friends, what shall become of Faustus being in hell forever? Yet, Faustus... Call on God. <laughs> on God, whom Faustus hath abjured. On God, whom Faustus hath blasphemed. <laughs> My God. I would weep. But the devil draws in my tears, gush forth blood instead of tears. Yea, life and soul. 
<laughs> he stays my tongue. I would lift up my hands, but see, they hold them. They hold them. Who? Faustus? Why, Lucifer and Mephistopheles. Oh, oh. gentlemen. Oh. I gave them my soul for my running. God forbid. God forbade it, indeed. But Faustus hath done it. I rid them a bill with mine own blood. Oh. But it is expired. This is the time, and he will fetch me. Why did not Faustus tell us of this before? That divines might have prayed for thee? Oh, what may we do to save Faustus? Talk not of me, but save yourselves and depart. God will strengthen me. I will stay with Faustus. Tempt not God, sweet friend, but let us into the next room, and there pray for him. Aye, pray for me, pray for me, and what noise soever ye hear, come not unto me, for nothing can rescue me. Pray thou, and we will pray that God may have mercy upon thee. Gentlemen, farewell. If I live till morning, I'll visit you, and if not... <laughs> Faustus is gone to hell. I, Faustus, now thou hast no hope in heaven. Therefore, despair, think only upon hell. Oh, that must be thy mansion, there to dwell. Oh, thou bewitched friend, t'was thy temptation hath robbed me of eternal happiness. I do confess it, Faustus, and rejoice. T'was I that when thou wert on the way to heaven, damned up thy passage, thou took the book to view the scriptures, then I turned the leaves under thine eye. What? Weepest thou? It's too late. Despair. Well, hell. Those that will have on earth must be in hell. Faustus, if thou hadst given ear to me, innumerable joys had followed thee. But thou didst love the world. Gave ear to me, and now must taste hell's pains. Perpetually. Oh, what with all thy riches, pleasures, pomps, avail thee now? <laughs> Nothing but sex thee more to want in hell that had on earth such store. Music while the throne descends. Oh, thou hadst lost celestial happiness, pleasures unspeakable, bliss without end. Hadst thou affected sweet divinity, hell or the devil had no power on thee. Hadst thou kept on that way, Faustus, behold, in what resplendent glory thou hast sit on in yonder throne, like those bright shining saints, and triumphed over hell, that hast thou lost. And now, Poor soul, must thy good angel leave thee? The jaws of hell are open to receive thee. Now, Faustus, let thine eyes with horror stare into that vast perpetual torture house. There are the furies tossing damned souls on burning forks. Their bodies boil in lead. There are live quarters broiling on the coals that never can die. This ever-burning chair is for over-tortured souls to rest them in. These that are fed with sops of flaming fire were gluttons and loved only delicates and laughed to see the poor starve at their gates. But yet, all these are nothing. Thou shalt see ten thousand tortures that more horrid be. <laughs> oh, 
I have seen enough to torture me. Nay, thou must feel them, taste the smart of it all. He that loves pleasure must for pleasure fall. And so I leave thee, Faustus, till anon. Then wilt thou tumble in confusion. <laughs> oh, Faustus. Now hast thou but one bare hour to live, and then thou must be damned perpetually. Oh, stand still, you ever-moving spheres of heaven. The time may cease, and midnight never come. Fair nature's eye, rise, rise again, and make perpetual day, or let this hour be but a year, a month, a, a week, a natural day, that Faustus may repent and save his soul. <laughs> the stars move still. Time runs. The clock will strike. The devil will come. And Faustus must be damned. Where is it now? Tis gone. And see where God stretcheth out his arm and bend his ireful brow. Earth! Gape! Oh... No, it will not harbour me. Now, draw up, Faustus, like a foggy mist into the entrails of yon labouring cloud, that, when you vomit forth into the air, my limbs may issue from your smoky mouth, so that my soul may ascend to the heavens. The watch strikes. Ah, oh, half the hour is past. It will all be past anon. Oh! No end is limited to damned souls. Why wert thou not a creature wanting soul? Or why is this immortal that thou hast? Ah, oh, Pythagoras' metempsychosis. Were that true, this soul should fly from me, and I changed unto some brutish beast. All beasts are happy, for when they die, their souls are soon dissolved into elements but mine. Must live still to be plagued in hell. The clock striketh twelve. Oh, oh, it strikes, it strikes! Now body turn to air, or Lucifer will be thee quick to hell. Thunder and lightning, O oh soul, be changed into little water droplets and fall into the ocean never to be found. My God, God, Adders and serpents, let me breathe a while. I'll burn my books up. Ah! So that was our Doctor Faustus audio drama. Um, so we are now joined by our next guest, Adonia Richmond. Uh, who has done some amazing artwork for this uh, audio drama. So say hi, Adonia. Hello, thank you so much for inviting me. No worries, no worries. It's great to have you on. Um, it's great to be here. <laughs> you love to see it. You love to see it. Uh, so <laughs> Adonia is currently playing Bianca in uh, uh, Shakespeare Society show A Sly Taming. Uh, she also did the artwork for last year's audio drama A Massacre at Paris, which is also inspired uh, the artwork for this other Marlowe um, play, Dr. Faustus. Uh, so if any of you saw the Massacre at Paris, you will probably recognise the art style that Adonia used. And she also was in the Little Prince audio drama last year as well. So um, I've mentioned many times you have done some incredible artwork for Shakespeare Society over the years. Um, what was it like doing both Massacre and Dr. Faustus and what's your kind of process behind the uh, artwork that you do? Um, so I found it very interesting and I have to say it was also quite a new experience for me um, because although I had done art quite a lot, I've been doing it since I was young, yeah. um, I had never actually done an art piece for a play before. So I feel like everything that I'm doing this year is just super new. I said the same thing for the previous podcast as well. Like, <laughs> um, Also being in a slide taming is the first play that I'd auditioned for. So yeah, just a lot of new stuff. And it was really fun to do because I 
I just love the idea of, um, you know, visualizing a world in your head and then being able to draw it so that other people can see it. So it's like you're basically taking what other people imagine when they're reading a text and, you know, creating a, an image for them to look at because, um, you know, you don't actually have the play going on since it's an audio drama. So, yeah, yeah. it just, I feel like it just sort of aids the imagination a little bit. And, um, yeah, so um, I, I feel like I've found my art style through these <laughs> projects as well. I mean, I never really knew what my style was per se, because I would kind of fluctuate between realism and cartoonism. But now I think, yeah, no, we're um, doing art for the Shakespeare Society has really helped me um, find my artistic self. <laughs> incredible stuff, incredible stuff. And so you obviously did the title sequence for Dr. Faustus, um, the title card even. You did the Three Devils, which look incredible. Honestly, it's one of my favourite pieces of art um, for the Dr. Faustus audio drama, mainly because of the soundscape that uh, goes along with it at the start as well. I was really proud of how that turned out. Um, there's also the uh, Four Lads, um, the Three Scholars and Dr. Faustus. Um, the bit with the good angel and bad angel and Dr. Faustus and yeah those were some incredible pieces of artwork and uh for those of you who have uh or who are tuning in so far really hope you've enjoyed the audio drama and if you want some more please let us know we love audio dramas here we'll happily do them they're incredible um so I've asked every guest this so far uh we're now going to kick start this up again have you got any plans for Halloween actually have plans for today and tomorrow so nice. um <laughs> tonight i'm going to a halloween party with a couple of liberal arts people oh nice I liberal nice. arts good um, stuff good stuff and, <laughs> yeah and then tomorrow i'm doing i think we have a shakespeare sock event on we do Five yeah 30. yes we do that's my plan for tomorrow so yeah and i'm also <laughs> dressing up as cruella oh nice nice yeah my new favorite film I, I really enjoyed Corella. Um, there was a so my me and Supan did an episode of Bart. It was the first episode we did actually. Um, there was a clip that I cut out just because of the runtime, where um, I talk about Corella because it was the last film I saw before moving into my uh, current uni house that I'm in now. I saw it with my family, and it was a really good film. Really, I I I love the costume for Emma Stone. Emma Stone's Cruella, and it was just a, it was, it was a fun film. I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. No, it was awesome. I just, I, I think that it's also really badass to have, like, two, um, female protagonists who are also villains, but not just the stereotypical villain, Yeah. that makes sense. It's more like, like, they actually have, uh, a backstory, and, you know, it shows that they're actually people, and they're human, so that's kind of what I like about the film as well. Um, as well as them being you know like the acting is very good and everything is just awesome about it I love it <laughs> it yeah honestly I you know if you haven't seen Corella, I'd like give I'd give it a recommendation I check it out I check it out so um we had a little pre-discussion kind of before we did this episode before we started recording uh, you have quite a lot of uh ghost stories from your hometown you also quite knowledgeable with um sort of elizabethan uh torture methods which doesn't go against you know oh, the type of person don't you try are. that at home <laughs> definitely don't try that at home <laughs> uh, uh part times is pg uh, in case anyone was wondering uh i think i don't know it is now it is now um cassie and jack may disagree but um we're we're, we're canonizing that bar times is pg uh, we'll try to keep it PG on. We'll try to keep it PG. Oh god. Because yeah. uh, uh, it's Halloween. Can you give us a little insight into uh, some of the stuff that you know? I know about this personally, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um stuff, I will tell stuff. you a couple of the worst torture methods that I have heard of to date. So um uh, I think the absolute worst one that I know of is the brazen bull. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but I have. I have heard yes, of the brazen it's bull. It's brutal. Basically, yeah. um, they would place the accused person inside a brass bull with like a, 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 a hollow one, obviously. Like there is a space big enough for a man to fit in. 
yeah. and they would put a fire below it and just heat it up until the person is essentially cooked. And I think Jeez. the absolute, but more disturbing than that is the fact that there would be a crowd watching this event and being entertained by it. And they wouldn't even hear the screams of the person because there was, um, I'm not sure how this works exactly, but there is some kind of mechanism inside the bull's throat that um, changes the screams of the person into bull sounds. So it just yeah. sounds like a boring animal. And, What's more, if you want to hear more gruesome detail, is the fact that burning bodies don't smell very nice. So in order to avoid that unpleasantness, they would add incense inside the bull's nose so that Jeez. when the smoke was out, it wouldn't be the smell of burning bodies, but just nice smelling incense so nobody would really know what's happening inside the bull and would just be entertained by the show. That yeah, is that insane. Is Christ. Okay, wow. Well. <laughs> well right. that's uh yeah. definitely one for the halloween spirit so uh yeah no that is that is incredible that's really I hope interesting that's PG enough i tried my best to not make it too <laughs> terrible i'm sure it's <laughs> you fine don't go into detail. i'm sure um, it's fine i'm sure it's fine um oh god let's see what else do we have yeah, let's so... roll off some more facts roll off some more facts uh, right another one which is absolutely awful i will leave uh okay i have a kind of funny one but i'll leave that for last just to that's cool that's cool Another disgusting one is, you know, the, oh, I'm not sure what it's called, but using rats as torture. So basically they would place oh. rats <coughs> and place yeah. it on the stomach of a person. And I think they would heat up the cage and that would make the rats go crazy. And because they were essentially burning alive, they had no place to go, but to dig into the person. And oh, yeah, and they yeah person there well to be fair like like the cage would be burning the person as well and the rats would be eating into their internal organs so that i think is probably even worse than the brazen bull that's it, sort of from i was gonna say um i don't know if you've seen uh 1984 or like read I the play 1984. i've read the book i've read the book it's so good i know exactly what you're talking yeah, about yeah the the rat trap yeah yeah I hate it so much. I hate it too. I hate it too. I hope um, everyone else listening will hate it as much as we do. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> take away from today, uh, read 1984 and hate it. Just hate, hate it. it. Absolutely <laughs> hate it. <laughs> uh, um, I think we'll. I think we'll have the funny. The funny uh, one. I, I've just been saving. It's not very funny, but it's funny for reasons. I've been saving the best for last. So oh, um, <laughs> the last method that I've I've actually read about this recently is the scold's bridal. And what I okay. found kind of funny about this is the fact that uh, just you know speaking of taming of the shrew, which is yeah. one of the, the you know the the main um, show that's going on this term. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this torture method is definitely not as brutal as the rest, but if there was a woman who'd be too outspoken or sharp-tongued, which is the definition of a shrew, then um, her husband would be allowed to put this, like, metal mask, like a muzzle on her face. This it this was actually like so it was specifically for shrews. That's how yeah. it was written to be. So yeah, great, and yeah. So it's mainly that it's it's not as bad, but it is very uh, misogynistic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Elizabethans, they uh, yeah, misogyny was running rife in that time. It, yes. <laughs> a big yikes! A big yikes! It um, used to be. It actually used to be. Uh, uh, deemed as a criminal offense if a woman was too outspoken. Yeah, I remember really? reading that um somewhere. Yeah. But yeah, no, that is that's yeah. really interesting. Um, and finally, so you um, okay, this bit might be cut, but you grew up in the town of Norfolk, or you live in the town of Norfolk, or both? Um, okay, so I grew up. Wait, sorry, which is the bit that was cut? So basically, I just wanted to clarify if you grew up in the town of Norfolk or you're living there currently, because I was going to go no, into like... I didn't grow up there, so I'd lived there for the past. Anyway, sorry, sorry I didn't know which... No, that's cool. Be, but yeah, okay. So, okay, cool. So finally, um, you live in the town of Norfolk um, and you've got quite a lot of uh, stories and urban legends from your hometown that you wanted to discuss on this episode today. So um, the floor is all yours once again. Uh, take it away. Thank you. 
Um, so basically my family currently lives in Norfolk and I lived there for the past eight years, up to uni anyway. Yeah. Um, and I know that it is a, you know, a lot of, well, I lived in Kingsland particularly, which is a medieval town. So it has a whole lot of history surrounding witchcraft, bloodshed. It's, it is very dark and a lot of people, uh, truly believe that it's haunted. And there are a couple of, you know, like various legends surrounding Kings Lynn being like, you know, this type of town and also connected to the fact that it's a, um, it's a coastal town. So they had a lot yeah. to be a very prominent fishing town as well. So the harbors were uh, what used to, you know, uh, make most of the money for the townspeople. That's how they yeah. made most of them, through fishing, through um, uh, imports and all of that. Um, so, right, anyway. I will start with the Devil's Footprint, which is uh, a pretty well-known urban legend during the Elizabethan era. And um, yeah, I'm not sure if it's ex- like precisely from the Elizabethan era or it's from medieval times. Um, but anyway, so the story behind the Devil's Footprint goes that um, at some point, this ship came into a harbor in Kings Lynn and the devil was on there. And the devil got off the ship and, you know, like started setting foot into the town. But it just so happened that there was a priest nearby that saw him coming in. And uh, while the devil was trying to, you know, like enter the town, the priest stood in his way and started basically pushing him back into the ship through some kind of mystical powers. I'm not exactly sure how that worked, but yeah. yeah. And the devil resisted so much you know, like he was struggling, he was trying to get back into the town, um, that his footprint got embedded into the cobblestone. And uh, yeah. it used to be said that it used to be visible. Yeah. But now uh, it's no longer there. But like the legend is still quite, you know, prominent. And some people actually are said to believe it. Fair. Yeah. Um. And, okay, so I have two more urban legends, one being the Witch's Heart. And the Witch's Heart of King's Lynn uh, actually is a tale surrounding an actual, you know, like a real person that had been accused of being a witch. Her name was Margaret Red, and I'm not exactly sure why she was accused, but... uh, yeah, she had been burnt to the stake in Tuesday Marketplace, which is where I lived. Yeah. And um, so what happened was her heart apparently flew out of her chest while she was being burned and hit a wall. And ever since then, there's been this sort of like heart shape engraved into the wall. And that Ooh, is the okay. story behind it. That's um, interesting. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> so the last story I have is about... It's quite funny, actually. I'm always just saving the funny ones for last. <laughs> but it's about a woman whose name was Mother Gabley or Gabley. I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, but she was accused of witchcraft because 13 men on a ship had died, um, I think, on a dock somewhere. Yeah, somewhere yeah. around the Kingsland or Norfolk area. And uh, yeah, I think someone just thought that it was her because she she had this weird reputation of cooking eggs in a really odd way <laughs> so it's really bizarre that. let me explain <laughs> that so okay. um when she would boil her eggs she would stir very quickly and i think some of her neighbors noticed this and started saying shit like she's a witch she boils her eggs in the weirdest way possible <laughs> um so yeah when these men died everyone started saying that her stirring the eggs vigorously had somehow somehow caused a hurricane on the sea or the river or whatnot and caused these men to drown <laughs> and she was burnt to the stake for that reason that is wild that is absolutely wild um and that's actually a nice place to kind of end uh, your little minisode so Thank you very much for uh, coming on as a guest and thanks once again for doing the incredible artwork for uh, Dr. Faustus. It's been great to have you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. No worries. Um, So we're now going to move on to our last guest of the evening, uh, Jack Cardman. So uh, we have just 
uh, listened to Dr. Faustus. Um, obviously, we had Adonia on as our previous guest. We are now joined by the man himself, Mr. Jack Hardman. I've summoned him. Hello. From... Hello. He is back. I've summoned him. I'm back. From the... He is back. He is back. I've summoned him from the depths of Shakespeare Society. Um so yeah, we are joined by uh, current Raw Holloway third year zoology student, Mr. Jack Carpman. Uh, say hi for us one more time, Jack. Hello again. Good stuff. Good um, stuff. <laughs> good stuff, good stuff. Um, right, so for those of you who don't know, Jack Carpman has uh, been in several societies and several different roles, both in crew, on stage, and in committee. He was Emmett in Legally Blonde, he directed Love's Labour's Lost in his first year, he directed a number in the Winter Showcase in his first year, he played Orestes and Aphigenia in his second year, he was Marco and Topsy Turvy in his second year, he was also Shakespeare in In Your Dreams, he was Social Psych of Shakespeare Society in his second year, he was the co-host of Bad Times last year alongside Cassie Dixon, so it's great that we've got you back on the show as a guest this time. Mm. He was Angelo in Measure for Measure, and his most recent appearance is the fight and movement choreographer of A Sly Taming. So, as I mentioned in that ramble of speech that I read off my iPad, uh, you are the, or you were even, you were the uh, (laughs) co-host of Bar Times last year. Mm. How does it feel to be back on the show? slightly surreal i'm not gonna lie to you uh it's it's weird hearing the the and hello everyone it's nice to be back on bar t- is yeah it's it's, yeah. it's weird hearing the intro from the other side and the general preamble um yeah. i'm enjoying it though i'm enjoying it nice good you should be you thank should you be. <laughs> good uh so i'm gonna ask the question that i've asked every single guest on this show have you got any plans for halloween do I have any plans for Halloween? I have a, I have a few uh, kind of pots on the stove. We were discussing before this episode what that phrase was. Nice. Um, we still <laughs> we'll, haven't got an answer. There are so many we'll kettles boiling. Uh, we'll go with well, it. We'll go with yeah, it. Yeah, no. Um, yes, uh, I have. I have a few. I have a few things going. One of which is the social hosted at the Pack Horse by Shakespeare Society themselves. So please come along nice. to that. Um, I'm not social sack anymore, but the current social sack, I'm sure, will be, you know, happy for the publicity. So please do come along <laughs> to that if uh, you have, uh, if if you don't have anything planned for tonight. Very good, very good. Um, by the time this episode goes out, uh, obviously, if those of you who have listened to this, you would have heard uh, this announcement already. Uh, but hopefully, as you're listening to it, you'll be walking down to the pack course to join us there. Uh, we all just be vibing, having drinks, having a good time, and just kind of seeing the night through in quite a nice, chill fashion. It's going to be a lovely time. Yeah, so um, we're going to switch things up a bit. So our last guest, Adonia, has talked about several different facts from kind of her hometown and stuff that she sort of knows. Uh, rather nice. than kind of repeating the same kind of stuff again, uh, we're going to talk a bit about the Dr. Faustus uh, audio. I say audio drama, audio extract drama. Um, that we nice. wanted to show very good i uh, you can just tell... a series of words <laughs> series of words but it's fine extract you know. drama play <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just list them in the hashtags at the end of the uh the podcast nice. so <laughs> that'll be fine um but basically uh those of you who don't know we at shakespeare society don't just do shakespeare i know Shock shocking horror. I know, I know. We also uh, dive into the contemporaries. So last year we did um, an audio drama of uh, Christopher Marlowe's Paris. Massacre at Paris, directed by uh, Rebecca Bellis, um, and also featuring the artwork of Adonia, uh, who, mm. we, with, who we already mentioned has done an incredible job with the pieces of artwork for uh, this Dr. Faustus audio drama. So um, obviously you played uh, Faustus in that. You had a lot of lines and one hell of a speech. How did you find sort of recording that? Uh, I think it's really interesting. I think voice acting is something that I've definitely not done that much of. But I mean, just as, uh, you know, as one door closes, another opens, during the pandemic it was one of those things like crocheting or that you know people picked up i think (laughs) and especially actors picked up a lot of kind of 
uh, looking into voice acting as as something to do. Uh, I if Janaya was actually a really great opportunity to kind of hone that. Um, directed by James Shannon, uh, a very interesting learning experience uh, on that side. And again, even this, like I feel like uh, I have definitely kind of learned a lot since then which was about a year ago now actually probably yeah. over a year ago Man. i think the actual audio drama itself came out um i want to say the week after reading week so i remember it being kind of early november time when the final because i think it was uh so i was working on quite a few projects and i think it was the week after uh the fever which was something i was mm. uh stage manager on when that came out it was a busy old term for the service i think but, it was, yeah, because yeah. you were in uh, as uh, I mean, topsy turvy and in your dreams, and yeah, you were in yeah, so many projects. It was the, I uh, mean, same, but yeah, yeah, mate, we're busy little bees. <laughs> um, uh. No, but the uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it was it was interesting recording Faustus because it is, um, firstly, it kind of came up when I was thinking about it. How on earth do I sound like? there's a line in it which is something like oh i've been at school for 30 years or something like that yeah. i think how do you communicate using only your voice and no like images the like age and yeah. i think also kind of the panic of oh my god i'm about to get you know absorbed up into hell um yeah. i don't know it's something it's it's a challenging part but it's also a it was a lot of fun to do yeah, it's a lot of fun to do. I, I just, yeah. I mean, I love acting in all its forms, and I think this was just a really fun little project. Thank you, thank you. Like, I mean, it was interesting conceptualizing it because um, obviously everyone would have listened to the finished product. You'll notice at the end uh, when Faustus gets absorbed into into hell, uh, there's a lot of like glitch sound effects and. I had a field day going through this program called Zap Splat, <laughs> trying to find a whole bunch of different sound effects to use. And I remember mm. as well trying to figure out play or playing around with the very last line where you kind of cry out to Mephistopheles. There's a bit where um, I had two or three different audio takes of Faustus's line, but I put it through like two or three different voice filters. Mm. And the one that it kind of ends on is really it's, it's quite muffled it's very glitchy and I was doing it and I had a eureka moment where I thought this is the moment where Faustus is taken and kind of trapped it's yeah. almost like he's in this kind of hellish cycle so there's quite a lot of motifs that go through there is this kind of glitch closed the door which is used quite heavily for uh, the good and bad angel when they kind of enter through various different things um, there was a I say a stage direction uh, well, there is a stage direction in the script that I found, which is they go through multiple doors. So I was thinking, how could I sort of play around this? Um, also, even when the three devils are talking at the start, there's obviously um, the door that closes and then bang into the office scene. So it's kind of that, you know, it paints a picture of your mind. Uh, these devils are watching from hell, obviously. Yeah. So I kind of envisioned that the bad angels also from hell. So that's why there's still the kind of same hellish soundscape playing in the background. Right. Um, but the thing with audio dramas in particular, and this is why I'd love to do more of them, and it's why I wanted to do something like that for Bad Times, especially for the Halloween special, just having some kind of extract of a spooky scene from a Shakespeare or so contemporary play. Very spooky, yeah. very spooky. Um, it was because there's so much you can do with sound. And, you know, going back to Ephigenia, because I was the lead editor for that, we had live music uh, scored by uh, Matteo Ressa, who is a wonderful man. Mm, um, he is indeed. And playing around with different sounds for Ephigenia as well was so fun to do because, you know, the majority of it was set outside. Uh, we had to play around with different kind of uh, seascapes and kind of uh, background sounds. And it was really nice to just create some beautiful kind of visual imagery alongside these songs as well. And it was just great to do. Yeah. Um, I, th I think there's a, I know 
there a few weeks ago you had Victoria Armitage Green uh, come on yeah. to talk about editing. I think editing is such a wonderfully uh, kind of almost fragile uh, art in the yeah. it is you can by getting a second off here or there you can completely change the meaning of uh, something by just slightly muffling one line you can literally completely morph the entire tone of a scene yeah um back when i was editing the things for the dungeons and dragons shakespeare series yeah. which we released last year go check that out it's on the youtube channel they're very good um, they're very good theo's in it uh, that's why it's very good that's why it's very good <laughs> Um, the nepotism is running high today <laughs> mm, we enjoy it uh but the when i was editing those there were certain moments of okay where do i put like where can sound effects create moments of comedy where can it create yeah. moments of horror um and particularly with horror and with this because obviously the perks of us living together means i get to see the pre like the pre cuts to this so probably what you what all the list of listeners have actually already listened to um but for for instance the kind of uh, the ticking during that last long very long line um <laughs> from faustus it is uh I, th- I think that's just such a wonderful and terrifying almost uh alan poe-esque uh kind of motif to just throw in there which just completely i I think just completely energizes the scene um and yeah so uh, editing is such a such a powerful tool uh if used properly i think absolutely absolutely um so uh, we have come to an end for the uh, Halloween Bar Time Spooktacular. So thank you very much, Jack Hardman, for coming along. Uh, it's okay. been great to bring you back from the depths of... Uh... It, it's It's been <laughs> nice to be back. I shall now return to the underworld where I belong. Good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> Thank you very much for tuning in to this spooky episode of Bar Times. I have been your host, Theo Dudridge, and in the words of the bard himself, by the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. Have a good night, everyone. Goodbye.